Hello and welcome What The Finances to another episode of the What The Finance podcast, where we talk to experts to help gain a greater understanding about what is happening in the world of finance, investing and markets. On today's episode, I am happy to welcome Taylor Kikendall, Senior Energy and Mining Reporter, S&P Global Market Intelligence and Energy Evolution podcast host. So Taylor, thanks for joining the podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. No problem. So I guess, uh, you know, we were talking before how there have been quite a few changes recently in, in the coal industry due to some uh, energy issues around the world. But I guess, can you maybe talk to the viewers about your experience and how you've seen the industry change maybe over the past 10 or so years? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, we're talking about a very big change in fortunes for the coal industry over the last several years. But to kind of set the scene, um, I've been covering the industry for about 10 years now. And um, I remember when I started, the big uh, one of the big kind of debates was, are we going to do mountaintop removal? Uh, is that going to be a new form of mining that's going to be more destructive? Um, it turns out that that wasn't necessarily um, as big of an argument as people might thought it was going to be because we suddenly stopped using a all the coal that we were before. Um, at one point, you know, this industry accounted for 50% of the power produced in the United States. We're closer to 20% now. Um, I looked up some numbers before we jumped on here. And in 2008, we mined 1.2 billion tons of coal. Um, I believe in 2020, we mined less than half of that, around 550 million. Now, you did see a jump a little bit in, um, after the pandemic. And that's what we're seeing and what we're talking about now, this change of fortunes. Um, natural gas prices have come up, and that's allowed coal to be a little bit more competitive. Um, so we are actually mining and using a little bit more coal, maybe not as much as people might think based on where prices are at. And that's largely a function of just um, a long period of, of underinvestment in the sector. The sector is not it, to kind of put it bluntly, doesn't believe in itself, or at least it doesn't believe in growth in itself. So they're profiting, they're pocketing these profits right now, but we're not seeing anybody come out and say, well, hey, look, coal's back. Let's let's go all in. Um, I think they learned uh, from the mistakes they made about 10 years ago. Um, a lot of people, when they hear about the coal industry, first thing that's going to jump into their mind might be bankruptcy. Um, that'd be a very, very fair um, uh, take um, here in the US. We, at one point, were counting and we, we, kind of lost track, but at some point, 75, 80 bankruptcies had occurred in the coal industry. There's not a lot of coal companies. So that's a lot of bankruptcies, um, but that includes some of the biggest miners. And what's important to the, for the context of that and why we see them not making big investments now is what happened to then. Um, basically, there was a huge increase in metallurgical coal prices um, back around, I think, 2008 or so. And, and we saw this like really big rise and, and the coal companies wanted to jump in on that. So they started investing in a bunch of metallurgical coal assets. That's coal used to make steel. And they, they went all in um, and then the metallurgical coal price crashed. Um, now they've got all this, these assets they bought with debt. They had no way of paying it off. And so we saw bankruptcy after bankruptcy after bankruptcy. And it doesn't help that this is the same period that we drastically reduced how much we were you know, burning thermal coal. A lot of companies um, are involved in both aspects of this. So what's kind of left is this industry that's very, very ca cautious with their capital these days. They've, they've seen what happens when you, when you get too excited about high prices. Um, but we also have an industry that's kind of been beat down by this ESG movement. Um, obviously, if you're if you're an investor and you care about ESG, one of the easiest things to tick off, it might be coal, it might be oil, oil's up there with it. But like in terms of things that are easy to shove out the door, I think the coal industry is like right in there in that first group. So yeah, uh, basically to kind of sum it all up, it once towering industry um, lost lots of its production share, it lost its generation share. With that, a lot of the employees that used to employ are now gone and have gone to other sectors. Um, basically. In some, we're looking at a very much smaller player in the energy space, especially in the United States, than what we saw a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's super interesting. So it was most of the coal produced for domestic uh, use? Oh, yeah. So yeah. by far and large, the, the amount of the coal that we produce in the U.S., we burn here. Um, we do export a decent amount now, and the, that share has been growing a little bit. But um, the largest um, metallurgical coals pretty steadily being exported from the US. Um, when prices swing up, we uh, we tend to rise up and, and, and export more coal. Um, that's not to say that we don't export any thermal coal, we do. Um, it's just not the, the largest like kind of portion of our share. We are starting to look uh, more into uh, to other markets to, to send that coal to um, historically. Um, it's gone to Europe a good bit. Um, they're obviously scaling back coal use even faster than we are. So they're not a, a big customer anymore. Um, we were sending some coal to China. Um, turns out uh, when uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine, um, China started taking a lot of coal from Russia. So we're starting to see that picture change a little bit. 
Um, and then also we're starting to look at places like India, other Southeastern Asian countries where we do send some of our coal. Um, it's just, um, it's the kind of thing where it's like, it's always a nice bonus for miners that can find those markets, but um, they're not at the point yet where those markets are gonna take all the coal that they were producing for, for the US markets before. Yeah, I know with, with gas, you know, the price in say Europe and Asia is a lot different. There's a massive difference. Is that sort of similar with coal or is it quite consistent? Um, it's not too, it's not as far as apart okay. as it might be on say like gasoline and things like that. It, there is very like regional differences in prices. You also get into a lot of different um, coal qualities. So if anybody's out there and trying to look for like, oh, what am I going to invest in coal? Or what am I going to stay away from in coal? Very important to know what kind of coal you're talking about. In addition to, I, I alluded to earlier, there's a grade of coal known as metallurgical coal or coking coal that is uh, used in blast furnaces to make steel. Um, that's got a much higher energy content and generally fetches a much higher price than say thermal coal might. But um, even in, amongst thermal coal, coal, even in the United States, for example, um, Eastern coals go for you know a couple dozen bucks uh, a ton, um, but you might only get 12, $14 for it uh, from the Powder River Basin. Um, that's not random. Those are very different quality of coals. Uh, Powder River Basin coal doesn't have as much heat in it. Um, it also has more water. So if you're to transport it somewhere you've got coal that's got a lot of useless water in it and not a whole lot of energy content um, but the seams where we can mine it from are huge thick and very easy to access so you can offset the cost there a little bit so yeah that's one of the things that i always tell people like if you don't know much about coal um, you can try to separate it a little bit but again that that kind of esg boxes tend to just say no coal right no one says or are you going to make steel with this? Or are you going to, you know, make power and produce a lot of CO2 with it? Um, not to say that steel doesn't make its own, its own a lot of, you know, uh, have a huge CO2 footprint. But yeah, there's a lot to understand there in various coal qualities, and that can affect the price a lot. Yeah, which, uh, is, as you said, is very important, especially if you're investing or just, just looking at the market in general. So is it mainly used for energy production and steel, those sort of the two main uses? Those are the two uh, primary uses. You also have some other industrial applications, but like in terms of the large markets, um, volume-wise, thermal thermal coal dominates. Um, it just takes a lot of coal to, to make power. Um, metallurgical coal um, is not as, as big volume-wise, but a lot of times that'll be the big money maker for a coal company because you're selling it for a much higher price and um, generally you know, mining at a lower volume. But those that resource is also often more difficult to find. There's only a few select places where you can find metallurgical grade coal. Yeah. And I know, um, you know, probably the only reason I know much about it is because I'm, I'm from Australia and there was the whole thing about China recently, you know, not wanting yeah. Australian coal. So I oh, guess that's, yeah. a, that's been a huge driver on the international market. Um, yeah. Part of the reason that we started to see U.S. coal leak over to China, as you might imagine, it's not easy to get coal from from the East Coast of the United States to China. Um, and, and Australia has long served that role. Mm. Uh, well, because of the spat between those two countries and them no longer taking it, um, the market's kind of reshifted. Um, it's always been kind of interesting, like the, the, the coal market and the coal traders always seem to find a way, right? You can block this and prices didn't change much. We basically just saw the arrows of trade flow shift a little bit more so than see anybody use less coal or more coal because of those decisions. Yeah. So it's not, I guess, as geopolitical, maybe as oil or natural gas or those, would you say, coal? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't quite get dragged out in the news quite quite nearly as much. Um, it's also a market that tends to be a little bit slower, right? You uh, you you book your coal contracts for a long period of time, and and um, you're selling to big utilities. You're not necessarily so much can be uh, on oil gets like influence at the the consumer level. You know? Yes, yeah, so there's no active futures markets or anything like that either. Uh, I mean, there's or, there's yeah. some futures markets, yeah, but not a lot of people trading in the in the coal coal markets there. Which makes sense. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, how has it sort of evolved? We mentioned how there's been a bit of an, you know, uplift of demand, I guess. But you're saying that that maybe they've, these producers have been stung in the past before, so they're obviously happy for the more profit, but they're not going to expand production or anything like that. Is that what you're no. saying? Yeah, yeah, we're seeing a really big uh, shift in coal company attitudes about things. Uh, one of the, the, the examples I keep pointing to is um, Arch Resources. Um, first of all, if you went back a couple of months ago, that company was called Arch Coal. Um, they changed it to Arch Resources because they are seem to be separating themselves a little bit from that name. Um, but I mean, the, the, the big shift that they've been making there is that they, they want to make more metallurgical grade coal for steel making. While there's a lot of talk about greener um, processes for making steel, replacing hydrogen um, as the reductant in blast furnaces instead of using coal, for example. But um, for the most part, like we're seeing companies start to say, well, we, sorry, to go back there a little bit, we um, those, those technologies aren't 
quite as, as, as proven. So um, a lot of people still think we're going to need metallurgical coal for a lot longer than say we might need thermal coal. Um, and so companies are pivoting appropriately. We're seeing name changes like Arch Resources or Alpha Metallurgical Resources instead of um, Alpha Natural Resources and Alpha um, Coal. But um, yeah, so big pivot to these stilling companies, but they're also trying to position themselves as ESG players saying, okay, well, look, it's we, we, we're doing this the greenest way possible. You know, we're, we're trying, we, you didn't hear that like 10 years ago. We're also seeing companies start to dabble in stuff other than coal. Peabody just made a huge investment in solar. Um, we're seeing some um, some other coal companies try to figure out what they can do uh, with the assets that they already own. Um, for example, um, Natural Resource Partners, while not a coal miner per se, they primarily make their money from leasing coal properties to, to coal companies to mine and then collect the royalties off of it. Uh, we heard them say, well, we're going to look at our property and, and see if there's opportunities for storing CO2 underground and if we can lease the property for that instead of coal um, or they're trying to put forest lands on that property and, and, and make carbon credits. So we're definitely see these coal companies go from being very, very kind of adamant about like trying to go to business as usual and we're going to try to block all this stuff to actually start to diversify and, and get into other industries. Um, and, and if you get away from the United States, because for background, there is a big difference between how the U.S. works and how uh, other global mining companies works. Um, while there are like in the U.S., it's almost completely if you mine coal, you mine coal. That's been your main job since you, you rolled out your company. Right. You might have a couple of side businesses or little things, but that's mostly what you do. The bigger miners worldwide, though, when you look at like Glencore, BHP, they mine tons of coal and they mine more coal than a lot of our U.S. companies do. But they also mine a lot of other stuff and coals like maybe 10 or 15 or 20 or, or more or less of the revenue, right? It's not the whole the whole thing. We're seeing those companies start to pivot away from, from coal a little bit, whether they're selling those assets, um, some are starting to just, they're going to continue to mine coal, but they're putting kind of an end of life date on their coal assets. And they're looking at other um, opportunities in the metals and mining space, because there's so many right now. I mean, ESG doesn't mean we're going to mine less. Um, it probably does mean we're going to mine less coal. But there's, I mean, battery metals, you talk about lithium uh, that comes to mind as a big one, nickel. Um, these are things that these companies are starting to pivot to and do instead. And they, if you have the expertise in that and you have the resources, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity um, when it comes to ESG and net zero for these mining companies. It's just going to be a little bit harder for these in the United States just because they've for so long only mined coal and, and are only just now looks like starting to think about other stuff. Yeah, I guess why haven't they consolidated? Because as you said, there's those massive companies all around the world and, you know, BHP is another one that's, yeah, that they're huge. But I guess, as you said, there's not many in the US. Is there a reason for that? Or? Yeah, no, so I think the industry's talked about needing to consolidate for a long time. Um, I think uh, what it comes down to a lot of times is, um, pride would be one thing. Um, that's that's definitely a big issue, right? This is my company. I want to learn how. I want to do it. How I want to do it. Um, there's a couple other issues that, that come to mind. One being like, a, the, does your mix of assets make sense? Um, if you're an eastern coal miner that's primarily mining metallurgical coal, um, you don't necessarily want to deal with all the issues that the guys out in the Powder River Basin who are only mining thermal coal are mining. But and this is probably the the big thing. Um, it's the industry is pretty small. There's very few companies and it's hard to, to get much more consolidated than they are now without the FTC uh, stepping in. And in fact, they have. Um, just, I want to say it was two, three years ago. Um, sorry, you know, pandemic time, everything. It's hard to remember <laughs> the yeah. exact timelines. But uh, Peabody and Arch try to roll together a joint venture um, of their Powder River Basin thermal coal assets. And basically the court came back and said, no, you would control half of the Powder River Basin. Um, and we can't allow you to do that. Basically, it's a kind of a monopoly issue. Um, the interesting thing there is what they basically ruled, and this comes back to what we talked about on coal quality, um, Peabody and Arch's argument was, hey, there's we're only X amount percent of the United States coal um, or coal uh, production. It's not a monopoly if we just take over all these mines. But the court came back and said, but you will have, you know, I don't remember the exact amount, but let's say 50, 60 percent of this basin or more. And it's so they kind of make a good point on why quality is critical is a lot of the power plants that those serve. Um, can't burn coal from anywhere else. Their their plant's been engineered to the, the specifications of, those, of that coal. So while it looks like it's a big market that everybody can participate in, in reality, all these customers were going to be stuck with these two producers and maybe a handful of other smaller producers in that basin. So um, kind of long answer to that is the, the big players probably can't consolidate anymore. They could buy up some of these other smaller mines. But um, at this point, I think most of the probably strongest assets are, are sitting in the hands of people that either are too big to merge into other bigger groups or aren't interested in, in getting rid of their asset for whatever reason that might be. 
yeah, might just be too complex or they'd have to go international and they don't want to do that. Well, another big problem, you look at some of these coal companies that have tried to sell their assets. Um, a lot of people just aren't interested in buying. So, you know, how do you, how do you move an asset that nobody wants? Yeah, exactly. And as you said, there are a lot of people are trying to wind down. So it might only be an asset five, 10 years. And then from there, they'll go on to something else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So do you, you know, if we look at other commodities as a concern, that especially you mentioned AASG, move to renewable energy and the, the amount of metals that would require, there might be supply shortages going to the future. Is that something similar to coal, but maybe for a different reason that there's just not continued increases in supply, if that makes sense? Um. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. I think it's going to be, I mean, the, you have two very different stories there, right? Yeah. Like, I think that like, um, how how we move forward in the future for both of those is going to be very dependent on, on a lot of different things. But for one, we're seeing a lot of slowdown right now, um, just because of the world economy, right? We're seeing very limited investment. And I think we're also seeing like a kind of long-term underinvestment, even in mining mining space, even in critical minerals. So um, to some degree, like that we are, we're, we're seeing that play out already, even though people, there's a huge amount of demand for critical materials. A lot of these companies don't want to invest, invest because they, they have been burned by, by investing too much in coal, right? And then finding out that that went bust and um, kind of where inflation's at and everything else. Like everybody's like worried, like, well, if I invest in this, is there going to be a market for it? Like in a year, am I going to be able to sell it to somebody or especially am I going to be able to sell it at the price that makes sense for, for what I'm buying it at? Yeah, I think I, um, I'm not sure who it was, but someone in the US and government was saying, oh, we want, it was talking about uh, oil and gas. And I think they were saying, you know, we want them to produce for five or 10 years. And then after that, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll transition. And I guess that's the concern, yeah. you know, you're investing billions of dollars into these mines and equipment and et cetera, but you might not get that returns back in, in, in enough time. No, exactly. Yeah. A stranded asset is a real, real concern for everybody, right? Um, that's one of the things that people worry about now when we talk about um, green steel is a big problem. Um, everybody wants to make hydrogen-based steel, but the technology is not quite there. But we see all these blast furnaces that are getting ready to come offline. The traditional blast furnaces use coal in 10 years. Well, if we don't figure it out in time, if we don't get that green hydrogen in there in 10 years, we're going to get another wave of traditional blast furnaces. And nobody wants to build a blast furnace, operate it for five years, and then shut it down, right? It's the same with a lot of these other kind of like assets. It's do you eat the high cost of the new technology now knowing that it means you don't have to have an early retirement soon. Yeah. yeah it's like the, what we've seen with refineries and basically most countries for oil, which has been quite interesting. Uh, so yeah, if exactly. we look, yeah, if we look at, I guess, ESG in maybe other mining companies, well, in the U S you know, it has there actually been changes that you've seen in the past 10 years towards making sure they improve what they're doing, or is it potential maybe a bit, a bit of greenwashing there? What has been yeah. your opinion? I think every industry, is like it's affected by greenwashing right it's yeah. you're, you're, it's hard to find a space that doesn't have that i do think the mining industry is finally starting to take some of these issues very seriously um we look at rio tinto recently they had this huge report about um sexual harassment and their 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 um operations and what they can do to fix that i think companies are legitimately starting to take a, a look at what they can do with their operations to green them and actually yeah make those sort of steps i think the the thing that i keep hearing now is like you can't just keep talking about esg you can't just like check boxes or, 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 or tell people how it's a great idea. People want to measure that progress and see what you're doing in very concrete, with concrete examples. You, know, you have to be able to back that up. So while like, for example, a net zero goal was enough two years ago to say, well, we're gonna have net zero emissions by 2050 and people wouldn't ask you any further questions, right? Well, now they say, okay, is that scope one, scope two and scope three emissions? It's like, and what year are you gonna get to scope one? And how are you gonna to talk to your customers, get your scope three emissions down? And then they wanna say like, well, what have you done the past two years to get closer to that goal? You know, so it's just further and further detail that I think we're gonna see um, investor pressure continue to ramp that up. Do you think that will continue with like uh, the high energy prices we've seen recently, or do you think it might cool off a little bit? Um, actually, I think that we'll see that actually accelerate um, the, the transition for energy transition. I mean, if you look around and say, man, these fossil fuels cost so much, what are we gonna do? One of the solutions is to use less of them, right? I mean, if you're, if the economy was run on solar and wind right now, we wouldn't necessarily be talking about the increase of fossil fuel prices, right? So some might say, we're spending more, we don't want to invest more in new things. But at the same time, I think this is going to encourage a lot of people to try to get away from those traditional fuels. 
So it's like there's that tricky like balancing <laughs> acts between both, isn't there? I think trying to do both at the same time while keeping the, uh, you know, e- energy uh, system going. So if we, um, if you look at the coal industry, uh, what have been, I guess, the mi- biggest misconceptions that you you get? Because I'm sure you get lots of people <laughs> asking you about it yeah. and talking about it. Oh, there's a lot, and I think one of the first ones. First of all, everybody still, lots of people still get that pick and axe kind of like in their head, right? When they think about mining, <laughs> it's a very technological job. It's very uh, mentally demanding. Um, that's on the the kind of like the side that everybody just kind of gets gets wrong. Um, I think the other one, though, I think on the green side of things, I think people misunderstand the motivations of some of these miners sometimes. I don't think anybody's out there trying to wreck the environment, right? These guys like see what they're doing as a good thing. Um, they're They're giving people jobs. They're providing people energy. And that's all true. And um, on the other hand, like I think for years we've heard coal, the coal industry beat the drum about how they're absolutely essential. And if you take coal out of the mix, the power is going to go out. Um, people are going to be you know, struggling and the energy is going to cost more than you can afford. And none of those things have come to fruition either. I think it's all a very complex balance and all those things have a little bit of truth to them. But um, I don't know. I've always thought like when I talk to other people covering other industries, um, Everybody always thinks of the coal industry as like almost having these like pre-painted villains, right? And like, the, like they, it's the, there's like almost like a movie-based story here. But in reality, it's not really that, right? It's a, it's everybody's trying to meet these competing needs, and the coal industry's served that uh, role for a very long time, and is in the middle of transitioning to playing a much smaller role in the future. Um, and that's the reality of its environmental impacts and and things like that are, are very true. But also, I don't think anybody necessarily intended that. Um, if maybe overlooked as a generous way to think about how that all came about yeah that, that makes sense and i guess in the future so i know you've mentioned it a little bit now you're thinking it'll be there'll be a focus on metallurgical steel because that would be important uh, uh sorry coal metallurgical coal because that would be important for the creation of steel but you think there might be a wind down of sort of thermal coal slowly until oh. next 20 years when maybe we don't need it anymore is that sort of what you're thinking yeah, I mean, look, the U.S. and Europe will probably use about the same amount of coal this year, next year, as we did the last year or two. Um, you might see some small increases, um, but that's mostly coming off that 2020 pandemic low. After that, I think clear declines. Um, China and India is going to be burning more coal next year than they did this year, almost certainly. Um, China probably continues to grow their, their coal use for the next couple of years. Um, worldwide, I think um, 2020 was the first time coal use ever declined. Um, we've seen it rising again. Um, and so when we say that coal is going away, it's, we're not saying it's happening now or it's happening next year. We're just saying it's slowed down a whole lot um, after years of booming growth. Um, I do think we're somewhere near the edge of seeing, when we saw coal shrink during the pandemic, it showed that like it's not, it's not that impossible to think of like coal use going down world, worldwide. Um, so yeah, EU, um, the US continued declines. But uh, worldwide, we're going to see it growing slowly. Um, I think what's going to surprise people, and this is just me making a wild guess and speculating, I think we're seeing some pretty clear signs from China that they want to do something about their greenhouse gas emissions and they plan on reducing coal. It's just the kind of government that if they decide to do it, um, it's going to happen. Right now, they have to balance that against their growing power demand. But um, I think once they make big moves to reduce their coal use, uh, we're going to see that happen pretty quickly. Um, But whether that's you know, a couple, like 10 years out, that's probably pretty, pretty fair to expect. Yeah. I think they were quite surprised by the impact. I think the, you know, cutting off Australian coal had because, you know, from, you know, it's hard to know if it's true or not, but you heard that they, they had some struggle with, uh, you know, power cuts and all this stuff. And, you know, it, it could be why they've invested. I think they're looking to build over a hundred nuclear power plants. So they're trying to almost get away from the reliance on these, yeah, you know, exporters of coal. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, and they mine a lot of their own coal as well. Um, But I do, I think that while we're going to see them keep growing, um, I think eventually we're also going to see them try to get away from the fuel pretty quickly as well. And in a lot of ways, in the same way that Europe very much provided a a roadmap for how the U.S. could, could move away from coal, I think that the U.S. and Europe now have kind of made an even clearer roadmap for countries like or countries like uh, China and other places in the Asia to start make, kind of making the same moves. Yeah, which is important, and you know, those countries almost need it more just because of how large some of their cities are. And I think you know, New Delhi has has experienced re- real issues with pollution and smog, and it's going to be more of an issue going into the future. Oh, for sure.
Yeah. So Taylor, thank you so much for your time. And I uh, guess my last question is what do you want? Uh, what's one message that you'd like people to take away from our interview about coal or about anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let me think. Um, well, I would say I, so I grew up in, in West Virginia. Um, coal is very important to that state. Right. Um, and I think that, I think that we can, people can acknowledge that and think about that. This is something that comes up from the industry all the time. It's like, we, we, we were the backbone of America. We filled industrial revolution. That, that's all true. Um, but at the same time, I think that we're seeing a clear shift for other energies to be able to do the same thing. I think that's kind of finally started dawn on the coal companies as well. But yeah, I think um, while it's been important, I think it's also going to be very important that as we move away from those industries, that we think about kind of the communities and places that are going to change as a result of the shift and figure out what we need to do to kind of uh, make that transition work for them. Yeah, because I know the UK is a famous uh, case where in you know seventies, eighties they basically shut down all the coal mines, and you know some communities are still struggling today because that's basically all they had. So, do you think? Yeah, you're saying in the US that's a real important thing to focus on when that happens. Oh, for sure. I mean, you look at a, a place like West Virginia, Kentucky. Um, their whole economy has been turned upside down. I mean, like yeah. there's towns you can go into. Um, in southern West Virginia that look like a ghost town now it's um, I don't know it's kind of crazy and we just haven't seen a lot from people trying to replace that with other industry I mean it's difficult a lot of those people in towns like the people in those towns moved there and set up those towns because there was a coal mine next to it right mm -hmm. there's you take the coal mine out or stop mining coal and suddenly you've got a town in the middle of the in the middle of the mountains that doesn't really have any other industrial opportunities is that what attracted you to analyzing coal then <laughs> sorry <laughs> um no no I, so I, I started out um i was covering health issues music um everything else and basically just kind of got drawn back into west virginia and covering uh legislative issues I actually started covering natural gas um just kind of looked back into the coal space okay no problem but uh yeah taylor, taylor <laughs> thanks again for your time uh and i guess if anyone wants to keep up to date with maybe your work and what you're doing uh where were the best places for that be um, so we, a lot of our stuff's behind a paywall, but if you go to spglobal.com, you can find some of that. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, T-A-Y-K-U-Y. Um, also, I recommend people subscribe to Energy Evolution. We're on iTunes. Um, you can also find us on uh, Spotify and just about any other you know platform that you like to use for podcasting. Yeah, perfect. I'll put that in the description below. And yeah, I think I was able to read a few of them uh, on the website, SP. So yeah, there are a few available. So check them out if you want to. But uh, yeah, Taylor, thanks again. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening and if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you are leaving with some great value about investing, trading and finance. See you on the next show.